Today's video is brought to you by Card Kingdom, and you can pre-order all of the Strixhaven cards you need right now by heading over to CardKingdom.com. Hello everyone, it's Seth, probably better known as Saffron Olive, and it's time for another daily dose of Strixhaven spoilers. And who do we have some interesting stuff today? We are working our way into Prismari slash is it? Plus we got some more Boros slash Lorehold stuff from yesterday, some sweet mythic, some really interesting new spells, which means we should probably jump right into it, start talking sweet new Strixhaven stuff today, and First off, we have Magma Opus, a huge mythic, is it instant? Eight mana, Magma Opus deals four damage, divided as you choose to any number of targets, tap two target permanents, create a four, four blue and red elemental creature token, draw two cards, plus bonus ability. You can pay two hybrid is it mana, discard it, and make a treasure token, which might be more relevant than it actually seems. So Magma Opus, on one hand, if you look at all the modes that you get for 8-man on this card, it's pretty insane. Like, mode 1 is Pyrotechnics, instant speed, that's 5-mana. The tapping permanence is actually a hard one to find comparisons for. Kind of like a double fire and ice, but you don't draw a card. Let's say that's probably worth like 2 or 3 mana, I would say. And then you have uh, Elemental Summonings, which makes a 4-4 four, four blue elemental. It's 5 mana. It's also a lesson, which are a little overcosted, so like 4 or 5 mana probably. And then an Instant Speed Divination, which is probably 3 mana. If you add that all up together, you're probably getting something like 14 mana worth of effects for or eight mana. So from that perspective, it's actually a really powerful effect. Like if you cast this, it does a lot, way more than its mana cost would suggest. On the other hand, Compared to some of the other spells we have in Standard, it looks a little bit bad. Like, Emergent Ultimatum is 7 mana, essentially win the game. I don't know if I've ever managed to beat my opponent after they've resolved Emergent Ultimatum. Genesis Ultimatum, not quite win the game, but still very close to win a game. Even Inspired Ultimatum, which might be the closest comparison, dealing damage, drawing cards, gaining you life, uh, that hasn't really seen much play in Standard. Yes, Magma Opus is an instant, which is a big upside, but I'm really not sure if this is a spell you're going to try to cast, especially since the decks that could theoretically cast it are probably like Teamer Ramp or Soul Tie Ramp, and you can splash it off Pathways or something. And if you're in the ramp colors, aren't you just going to cast an ultimatum if you have the choice? Uh, on the other hand, you do get this interesting discard to make a treasure mode, which we've seen Wily Goblin be actually like kind of good. I think in general, a 1-1 body is probably better than a spell in the graveyard, although there are some reasons to make treasures in standard. We have like Magda, we have Goldspan Dragon, so maybe some sort of is it like spell slingy treasure style deck could be a thing. The other thing I really like about this card, and probably the most powerful way to use this card is not to plan on casting it for eight mana, but because of that discard to make a treasure mode, you can get it in the graveyard really quickly and then use Torrential Gearhawk to cast it for free, a free Flime Painter to cast it for free, Scholar of the Lost Robes to cast it for free. I think that might be the main way this card sees play. Like, let's say you're playing some sort of Is It or Jeskai control deck. Yeah, maybe sometimes you get up to eight mana and you cast this, but if you're playing historic you probably got torrential gear hulk in your deck and you're probably playing four of them so maybe you're just like casting this ramping into your torrential flashing it back with torrential getting your value that way in standard you can like turn two discard it make a treasure turn three a free flame painter still not convinced that's going to be insane but nah, it could be pretty good so i think that might be the main way to take advantage of this effect so i don't know as i mentioned before my main concern with this card is even though i think it's powerful unless you're cheating it into play with your from the grave yard. I feel like it's kind of a worse Genesis ultimatum. Is it as good as Elrond's Epiphany? And there is a cap. Like, let's say you're playing Teamer Ramp. How many seven, eight mana spells can you possibly play in your deck? Not that many, or until you ruin your curve. And then is Magma Opus going to be able to beat out Genesis Ultimatums, or Elrond's Epiphany, or Salt Eye Ultimatum? I'm just not actually convinced of that. So Magma Opus, obviously a ton of value if you cast it. You're getting way more mana 
in effects, then it's eight mana cost. So essentially, you're ramping yourself by like six mana if you add up the value of all these effects put together. On the other hand, compared to some of the really powerful spells we already have in standard, I'm not sure that Magma Opus stands up, so it might be more of a like combo piece almost, where you're trying to discard it into the graveyard, get it back out of your graveyard for free for less than eight mana, and in those scenarios, I think Magma Opus probably really strong. So a powerful effect, an expensive effect, at instant speed, but does it stand up to the rest of the format? I guess we're going to have to wait and see. We also got Grinning Ingus. This is a reprint that is legitimately exciting. I know it's only an uncommon, but if you've never seen Grinning Ingus before, this is one of the easiest ways to store off. So it's a 3-mana 2-2 elemental, but you can pay one, return it to your hand, and make 3-mana. So essentially, you can recast this an infinite number of times for a single mana, which we've been talking about thanks to Mystic Invocations, how we can storm off in historic how do you grape shot or tendrils or mind's desire grinning ingus is probably the easiest way to pull this off like with the grape shot win you just keep bouncing your grinning ingus to up your storm count then you grape shot for a bunch and if you could throw one more piece into this puzzle then you can go truly infinite like let's say you have a burgy god of storytelling or a nylea keen eyed or a maybe runaway steamkin if you have something like that on the battlefield then this becomes truly infinite like you can grinning ingus you make a mana with Burgie. That's going to pay the one extra mana it takes to bounce and recast Grinning Ingus. So then you can do it an infinite number of times. Like literally bounce it, cast it, bounce it, cast it, bounce it, cast it, bounce it, cast it, up your storm count to a million. Then you cast your Grape Shot. If you can get it set up so you have two of these cost reduction effects, like Burgie, Nylea, Runaway Steamkin, then you actually generate mana. Like if you have Steamkin and Burgie and Grinning Ingus, then you're making a mana every time you loop it because it's essentially costing you two mana to bounce it and replay it, but you're generating an extra mana and making three when you pick it up, so you're actually making infinite mana, which makes it even easier to storm off with. So I think if a traditional storm deck is going to be a thing in Historic, and you're going to win the game with, like, Grape Shot or Tendrils of Agony or Mind's Desire, this is going to be one of the go-to plans. Grinning Angus plus cost reduction slash mana when you cast stuff effects into your storm cards, easy way to win. In Standard, it's a little bit more convoluted, because in standard we don't have actual storm cards. Standard Storm is Magecraft, but Magecraft only cares about instants and sorceries, so bouncing your Grinning Ingus an infinite number of times doesn't really do anything with your Professor Onyx or whatever. On the other hand, in Standard, you can set up the same combo, but win with something that cares about a creature entering the battlefield. Let's say you have Burgie, Grinning Ingus on the battlefield, and a Terror of the Peaks. You can bounce your Grinning Ingus and replay an infinite number of times. Whenever it comes into play, you're going to be too your opponent with Terror of the Peaks, so infinite damage, kill your opponent, you can draw your entire deck with Great Henge, maybe there's some sort of Gruul deck that could take advantage of it if you add a Shia to the mix, then you are getting landfall triggers as well, so you can trigger your whatever, Felid Air Retreat, Lotus Cobra, for even more mana, so I think there are ways to combo off with Grinning Ingus in Standard, although they're a lot different and a lot more permanent base. You're not going to use it to actually storm off in Standard, but there are ways to go infinite with it in win the game. So Grinning Ingus is going to be really exciting. Are these decks going to be top tier breaking formats? We're going to have to wait and see. But Grinning Ingus is in some of the decks I personally am most excited to build in Standard and in Historic because of the combos that it enables. We also got some more learning, some more lessons, and I'm just not convinced. So Sparring Regiment... Three mana enchantment. When it enters the battlefield, learn. So you can grab your illuminate history, reduce to memory, academic probation, whatever. And then when you attack, put a plus one plus one counter on target attacking creature and then tap it. So the problem with all these cards is they're just not very good. Like the good aspect is tutoring up your lesson when you play sparring regimen. Because if you look at putting a counter on your attacking creatures, there's just better ways to do it for the same mana cost. Like look at Orin Reef Ooze. When it attacks, you get to put a plus one plus one counter on all your attacking creatures with plus one plus one counter sparring regimen is not a creature it's not ever going to be able to attack your opponent it's only putting a counter on one creature seems a lot worse than orn refuse or even bass recap like bass recap puts a counter on one creature and makes it indestructible kind of similar to untapping it but bass recap also can tick down to make a bunch of tokens or ultimate which will win the game over the course of few turns well sparring regiment is just snagging you a not that exciting 
being less a card out of your sideboard. So again, I'm still focused on these cards being best of one cards. I think in best of one, they're going to be awesome. I think in draft, they're going to be awesome. But I still haven't found myself convinced that this is a plan I want to execute in best of three. Next up, we have a super sweet Boros card. A Boros MDFC Flame Scroll Celebrant slash Revel in Silence. So Flame Scroll Celebrant, two mana, two one, human shaman. When your opponent activates an ability that isn't a mana ability, pay them for one and you can pay two to pump it plus two plus zero more exciting the back half revel in silence double white instant your opponent can't cast spells or activate planeswalker abilities this turn exile revel in silence so you can't actually lock your opponent out of the game i assume that's why they had you exile it is because there are effects that let you reanimate a creature to your hand each turn so if you were able to let's say revel in silence and then get it back to your hand every turn you could just soft lock your opponent out of the game by doing this every single turn so traditionally silence or revel in silence which is the easiest comparison mostly shows up in combo decks to like protect your combo you cast this your opponent has to counter it if they have a counter if they don't have a counter that's fine then you can do your thing and win the game but i actually think it's going to be pretty relevant in standard plus if you're in a boros deck you get a silence which isn't typically a main deckable effect on a body which isn't an insane body but is a reasonable body so Flame Scroll Celebrant compares most closely to Harsh Mentor, Emulation Shaman. The biggest difference is it triggers on any ability that isn't a man ability. Well, Harsh Mentor, Emulation Shaman, Artifact, Creature, and Land. So they're excluding Planeswalkers. They're excluding Enchantments, which I don't think is super relevant, but mostly excluding Planeswalkers. So you get a little bit of an upgrade as far as the pinging ability, but you get a bit of a downgrade as far as a body since it's only a 2-1, even if the pump ability is nice. Uh, disappointingly, neither Harsh Mentor or Emulation Shaman have actually proven to be constructed playable. There was a lot of hype about Harsh Mentor when it came out, and it just completely flopped. Uh, I don't think I've really hardly ever seen anyone play it in any format. So I don't think that's like a super exciting ability. On the other hand, I mean, it's a fine creature. Like, a lot of creatures do die to Bone Crusher Giant. This is another one. Some of those creatures, like Luminarch Aspirant, Robber of the Rich Sea Play, they do offer more immediate value than Flame Scrolls Celebrate. But really, I think the upside of this is you play this because you get an okay creature that sadly dies to Bone Crusher Giant, but you also get this silence effect. And this silence effect, I'm actually really excited for in Standard, which might seem odd. So, what do you do with silence? Uh, if you've never played older formats, I mentioned protecting your combo. That's one thing. You can also use it like a pseudo extra turn spell. Not a true extra turn, but if you wait to your opponent's upkeep and you cast this, your opponent can't cast anything. They can't activate their planeswalkers. They can still, like, attack you with their creatures. They can still cast a lockwing to draw a card or something. But you make your opponent skip most of their turn. More excitingly, this is a card that seems really insane against specific threats in the format. So, Revel in Silence. One of the reasons I'm excited for it is it lines up really well with certain effects in the meta. So uh, first off, I should talk a little bit about how this works. Something that confuses people sometimes if they've never played with silence before is you can't use it to counter a spell on the stack because it stops your opponent from casting a spell, which means once a spell's on the stack, it's already been cast. Revel in Silence doesn't do anything. So let's say you want to stop Genesis Ultimatum. If you let your opponent cast Genesis Ultimatum and then Revel in Silence, it doesn't do anything. Your opponent still gets the Genesis Ultimatum them. They still get to put their permanents into play. You're going to be really sad. Like, you stop them from casting more things that turn after the Genesis Ultimatum, but that's not really that effective. So if you're worried about Genesis Ultimatum, you want to cast Revel in Silence on your opponent's upkeep when they can't cast a sorcery, and that will keep them from casting it for a turn. On the other hand, there are a couple of cards in specific that are really heavily played that this lines up really well with. With Emergent Ultimatum, you actually can essentially counter it while it's on the stack. Your opponent, Emergent Ultimatum, they're going to tutor up their pile of stuff to win the game. With the Emergent Ultimatum on the stack, you revel in silence. Sure, Emergent Ultimatum is going to resolve because it's already on the stack. It's already been cast. But your opponent's not going to be able to cast the cards that they find with Emergent Ultimatum. So this is essentially double white mana, counter Emergent Ultimatum. The other hilarious interaction is Showdown of the Scalds. You let your opponent Showdown. 
They exile their four cards. They're getting ready to untap and go to town with all their new card advantage. And then on that upkeep, the turn after Showdown of the Skulls, you can revel in silence. Your opponent can't cast spells this turn. So they're going to lose the second lore counter. They're also going to lose the four cards that they exiled. And Emergent Ultimatum and Showdown of the Skulls are two really heavily played effects. So I actually really like this card. You get a body, which allows you to play this in your main deck. You're getting a silence effect that's really good against a couple of key cards in the meta. Plus can be good against control decks, plus future combo decks that might develop. So I think this might actually be a really good card, even though both halves are a tiny bit underpowered compared to other versions of these cards. When you put them together and you view it as a whole, I think this is a really strong MDFC, which has a lot of potential to see play in Boros decks in standard. We also got Cody, a cute little artifact. So three mana, legendary artifact creature construct. You can't cast permanent spells, but you can pay for and tap it to make a mana of each color. Then when you cast your next spell this turn, exile cards from the top of your library until you exile instant or sorcery with lesser mana value. Until end of turn, you can cast it without paying its mana cost. The rest go on the bottom. So Cody... I don't think you can play this in standard. As cute as it is, it's got a pretty big restriction. It reminds me a little bit of Steel Golem, which makes it so you can't play creatures, except Cody is even worse. You can't play any permanent. So if you want to play a Planeswalker, no. If you want to play a Saga, no. Random Artifact, no. Creature, also no. So this really needs to be in a full-on, like, Spell Slinger style deck to make it work, and I'm just not sure that's possible in standard. On the other hand, you are getting a pretty powerful effect, I think, in Commander. So it is essentially a mana dork. It's worded weirdly to make it legal as a five color commander. It could just be tapped out of mana, but to make it a five color commander, you need to have it worded that way. But it's essentially a three mana Birds of Paradise, more or less. And then you get kind of a Sunbird's Invocation type trigger. And I love Sunbird's Invocation, but there is one big difference. Sunbird's Invocation, you get the same effect essentially, except you can hit a card with the same mana cost as well as lesser mana cost. Cody, it's gotta be lesser mana cost, which means you can't take in like Genesis Ultimatum into another Genesis Ultimatum or Genesis Ultimatum into Elrond's Epiphany. You could cast a Magma Opus and hit a Genesis Ultimatum because Genesis Ultimatum is less mana so that's something to keep in mind it is a little clunky you can't chain the same spells together like you could with sunbirds invocation which i think means this is basically a commander card and one of the things we've heard lately is Wizards kind of went a little too far with five color commanders. They're kind of the best thing going in Brawl. They're some of the most popular in Commander proper because a lot of them are just all upside. You have like the Kenris of the world, which it just does everything. Like, why wouldn't you want that as your commander? Cody is a really cool take on a five color commander. It's still five colors, but it comes with a huge drawback that you got to actually build around, not being able to cast permanence. So it's not just all upside like the Kenris of the world. And then... It also pushes you to be, like, five-color spell slinger, but in a not-super-busted, like, yolo C type way. Like, if you want to play five-color ultimatums, five-color spell slinger, Cody is a way to do it that isn't going to get you immediately killed in arch enemy like Golos would. So, I actually really like this. This is where I would like five-color commanders to land. It's cute, it's funny, it has a huge drawback, a big deck-building restriction, but in the right deck, it's still really powerful, letting you double up a spell every single turn by also making mana. Next on our list, we have Elemental Evoker, a pretty sweet is it hybrid four drop? So four mana, all of it either blue or red. You get a four four orc wizard, which magecraft of when you cast or copy an instant or sorcery spell this turn until end of turn, target creature you control gains. If it would leave the battlefield, exile it instead. And when it's exiled, make a four four blue and red elemental creature token. So essentially, this is a way your spell slinger deck can protect your creatures, sort of. So I imagine what you do with this is you just play it with a bunch of instant speed effects. Even better, a bunch of instant speed adventure effects, because then you're getting creatures and spells all in one. So what I'm imagining this plays like is you run out your bone crusher giant, your opponent's like, all right, I better kill that. They go to kill your bone crusher giant, and you're like, eh, all right, cast an opt, target my bone crusher with elemental evoker. Sure, you kill my bone crusher giant, but I get a 4-4 four, four elemental. So I think that's the main plan. 
also could use it to protect itself. So essentially, you're giving almost all your creatures this weird sort of undying type effect. If you can play it instant speed, leave up your mana. And we have some decks in standard that might want this. Like we have the Dragon Go deck, where it's Goldspan Dragon, it's a bunch of adventures that you can cast to instant speed, a bunch of other instants. Being able to use this to protect your creatures from your opponent's removal seems really powerful. It is a little tough that you gotta tap out for a four drop, and it doesn't really do anything or protect itself right away. It's almost a card that you'd rather have at five mana or six mana, so you can cast this and then leave up your opt or your counter spell. So if your opponent tries to kill it, you can do something right away. So that might be the easiest way to play it. Also, I think this is a great card for Spellslinger Commander decks. Like, if you're playing Spellslinger Commander, especially this type of Spellslinger that wants to play on your opponent's turn, like Calamax, Savine, uh, Nim is it also kind of does. So if you're playing on your opponent's turn and leaving up mana, Elemental Evoker is great. This is like your Wrath Protection. It's a way that if your opponent's going to go to kill your creatures, you're at least going to get something in return, and the cost, once it's on the battlefield, is really low because you want to be casting spells anyway. So I actually like Elemental Invoker. I don't know if this is a staple card. It's still a four drop that doesn't do anything immediately. Uh, its stats are fine, but not super exciting. So is this going to be a new standard staple? No, but I think in the right shell, in standard or in commander, it does have potential to be playable. You got to be playing a deck that's playing a lot of spells, leaving up mana on your opponent's turn. But in that shell, I think Elemental Evoker is actually a really powerful way to keep your creatures going to protect yourself from removal and wrath. We also got Creative Outburst, another big is it spell. So, seven mana including double blue, double red, instant speed, deal five damage to any target, look at the top five cards of your library, put one in your hand, the rest of the bottom of your library, and the same ability we saw earlier, pay two hybrid is it mana, discard it, make a treasure token. So creative outburst, it's like a twist on prophetic bolt. Prophetic bolt, five mana, four damage, four cards deep. This jumps all the way up to seven mana, which is admittedly a lot. Like seven mana, that is literal ultimatum mana, which might mean this, again, is a card that you're actually playing because you're trying to get it out of your graveyard with Torrential Gear Hulk or a free Palm Painter because you can discard it easily. As far as just casting it in standard, I mean, yeah, it's an instant, but just compare it to the ultimatums. And maybe that's not fair because it's uncommon, but still, it's hard for me to imagine decks casting this fairly in standard when something like Inspired Ultimatum, which does a lot of the same stuff, plus a lot more, has seen essentially zero play. So Creative Outburst, I think it's a sweet card. If there is a deck that can take advantage of it, it's a good gonna be some sort of Is It Draw Go deck where you're always leaving up mana. Maybe you got Goldspan to ramp into it. It is powerful if you resolve it, like five damage and a dig for a card effect is not bad. It's just that seven mana is a lot. So I think, is it possible there's a deck that's like playing a copy of this as a pseudo finisher on the top end of his curve? It is. There could be an is it control deck that could do that. But I really think the most exciting aspect of all the big is it spells we've seen so far is to discard to make a treasure mode, allowing you to cheat it out of your graveyard for less than its mana cost. We also got our exclusive empty goldfish preview card from Strixhaven, Wandering Art archaic slash explore the vast lands and not gonna go super deep about this one because i just posted a video and an article talking all about this card which there's a card pop it up somewhere, click on it. You can see a big breakdown of Wandering Archaic. But Wandering Archaic, the front half, colorless 4-4-5 four, 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 avatar creature with an ability where whenever opponent casts an instant or sorcery spell, they can pay two. If they don't pay two, you get a copy of that spell for free, and you can even choose new targets for it. So obviously the ceiling on that's really high. You play this, your opponent Genesis ultimatums unwisely without two mana available, and you get a Genesis this ultimatum, that's pretty bonkers. On the other hand, Explore the Vast Lands, it's a weird one. Three mana, colorless sorcery, lets each player dig five card deeps in their library to grab a land and or an instant or sorcery, put them in their hand, and the rest go to the bottom, and each player gains three life. So kind of like a, I don't know, a pieces of the puzzle almost, except it impacts all players. So first off, as far as standard is concerned, not super excited about Wandering Archaic. Like, once you get up to four or five mana, you're getting Questing Beasts and Showdown of the Skulls and Elder Gargaross and really powerful threats that do things right away. Watering Archaic, 
yeah, it taxes your opponent, but it has to sit out on the battlefield. Your opponent can theoretically kill it and pay the two, and it doesn't do much of anything. Its stats aren't very exciting for five mana, so once you get up to those mid-range four, five, six mana plays, I just don't think Wandering Archaic does enough. Like, taxing your opponent's great, but it seems easy enough to play around. And then Explore the Vastlands, oh boy. Cards that benefit both players equally are inherently risky to cast, because the problem is you're the one investing the three mana, your opponent, they don't got to invest three mana, but they can still get an instant or sorcery and a land, and they gain the life. There are situations where it can be fine, like you're up against an adventure deck, and your opponent has like no instant or sorceries. Then you can theoretically break the symmetry a little bit. The other problem is, if you're casting this early game, your opponent's going to get the first whack at casting their spells, because you're probably using all your mana to explore the vast lands. So you hit like a Genesis Ultimatum, and then your opponent hits a Duress, let's say, and then they Duress the Genesis Ultimatum, and you kind of spent three mana for not much of an impact so i would be really surprised if this was a standard card on the other hand this is a pretty spicy commander card like wandering archaic looks a little bit like smothering tithe looks a little bit like ristic study these if you don't pay this tax i'm gonna get something powerful so that's already an effect that seems pretty good could maybe show up in tax stacks that make it hard for your opponent to have the extra mana to pay it downside is it is a creature which means Worst case, you play this, and your opponent's just like, all right, swords to plowshares, pay the two, you get no benefit out of it. Although, I really, really love about this card in Commander, that you can do some really cool political things with it, where you're like, all right, I'm gonna play this, uh, Tomer, play your removal spell, choose not to pay the two, and I will hit this creature that we both want off the battlefield or something. So there are some ways you can uh, politicize your way into more value out of this card. Explore the vast lands. I don't think you ever want to cast this card in Commander unless you're a group hug deck. If you're playing like Feldegrift or something, then sure, because you're all about giving the table value, hopefully using that to your advantage politically. The problem with Explore the Vast Lands, though, is when you have three opponents, when you think about how this works, let's say everyone hits max modes with this card. Your opponents are going to gain nine total life and draw six total cards. You are going to spend three mana. You're going to draw two total cards, gain three life. So the rest of the table is benefiting way more than you are if you resolve and explore the vast lands so i think it's pretty limited to group hug decks or desperation mode like if you're about to die and you gotta hit a wrath and that's your only hope then you play it because it's wandering archaic and just kind of yolo explore the vast lands hope you hit the damnation or toxic deluge or wrath of god or whatever to sweep the board and sure your opponent's got more value but at least you're not dead so wandering archaic explore the vast lands i'd be really surprised if they were standard staples or even standard playables but in commander they can do some sweet things. If Wandering Archaic sits out, it's insane. Either taxing your opponent or maybe getting you some free spells. Plus, you might run into someone like me who just refuses to pay the two on principle. And then, Explore the Vast Lands. Probably don't usually want to cast it unless you're a group hug deck, but I don't know. There are scenarios where it can be powerful. We also got our Prismari Elder Dragon, Galazeth Prismari, and oh my goodness, is this card insane. So it is four mana for a 3-4 Flying Elder Dragon. When it enters the battlefield, you get a treasure token, so in a weird way, it's kind of only 3 mana, because you're getting that mana back. More importantly, artifacts you control have tap, and a mana of any color, spend this mana only to cast instant or sorcery spells. So, you don't even have to sack your treasures when you have this out. You can just tap them for mana, and any other artifacts you happen to have, which I don't know if you're trying to win with, like, Revel and Ridges, or something else that cares about having a lot of treasures on the battlefield is actually a really major upside so this card is good in a whole bunch of different ways at first glance it's kind of like goldspan dragon but it's on curve with goldspan dragon so you can play galazeth into goldspan dragon not quite as good as goldspan dragon since it doesn't let your treasure stack for two mana but you can play this and like immediately have mystical dispute mana up because you just tap your treasure cast the mystical dispute to save your galazeth from a removal spell or something which seems very very solid, especially with how these synergize together, two powerful flying dragons, both making treasure tokens and powering up your treasure tokens. And it kind of has this Urza ability. Like, remember Urza? Tap an artifact at a blue mana? Well, Galzeth kind of does that. Sure, you can only cast instant or sorceries, but we got big busted instant or sorceries in standard. Genesis Ultimatums, Magma Opus, Creative Outburst, some of those big is it spells that we've kind of been like, eh, they seem a little expensive. They're going to get a lot easier to cast.
cast if you're playing cards like Galazeth in your deck to make treasures and tap your artifacts for mana, and Urza is like certifiably busted. One of the best commander cards, although it is worth pointing out, uh, Galazeth does not have the shuffle your library, cast the spell for free ability, which makes Urza so powerful. The mana part is nice, even if it is limited, but it's not an infinite mana I win payoff in the way that Urza is, so I'm not saying it's as good as Urza, but the ability is kind of similar. Also, we got like Magda still in standard, which really cares about treasures, and it cares about dragons. And then in commander, not only can Galazeth be a unique artifact commander, where it kind of pushes you towards artifact spell slinger which is kind of a unique archetype different than a lot of other is it artifact based commanders where not only do you want to make a bunch of artifacts but you want to cast spells with those artifacts to make even more mana to cast more spells but it seems good in the 99 of other artifact based commanders like Sahili, Brea, Joyra if you're playing a bunch of artifacts this is just a way to add extra mana like sure you do need some spells in your deck but even if you're artifact based you're probably going to have your cyclonic rifts and your whatever, Blue Sun Zen is some sort of big spells, Blasphemous Axe and the like. So you should have some spells anyway. So Galazeth, this card's pretty crazy. I think this is a great standard card. It has synergies in the format. It's a good standalone card. It has a ton of upside on a good body, even with that discount, essentially, because of the treasure token. And it seems like an insane commander card as well. So this Elder Dragon, unlike some that we've seen so far where we're like, eh, I mean, that's cool, but I can't imagine playing it in standard. This is one that I think walks the line between being sweet in commander and sweet in standard, which is a pretty good spot to be for a new streak saving card. We also got a couple of interesting cheap cantrips, Curate and Expression Rehearsal. Uh, so Curate, two mana, instant speed. Look at the top two cards of your library. You can put any number into the graveyard. The rest go back, draw a card. Expression Rehearsal, pretty interesting. Blue and a red, Sorcery. Look at the top three cards of your library. One goes in your hand, one goes on the bottom. The other gets exiled, but you can play the exiled one until end of turn, which is actually kind of neat. It can turn into a draw too. So Curate is essentially Deliberate, except with upside if you're a graveyard deck. If you're not a graveyard deck, then it's essentially the same card, like a weird preordain that costs you two mana. But if you're a graveyard deck, being able to mill two is much better than scrying two to the bottom. So keep it in mind for graveyard decks, Deliberate hasn't really become a staple by any means, but it's like close to being playable. And then Expression Rehearsal, I actually really like this card. Be it reminds me a little bit of a bunch of different things like worst case it's kind of a sorcery speed anticipate you cast it you exile a card one goes to the bottom you don't have the mana to cast the exile card you get one in your hand that's fine the upside is it can turn into a charter course essentially where it's a two mana draw to in the late game when you meet a condition in this case the condition is the mana to cast the card you exile and two mana draw twos are pretty powerful so i think both of these cards have a chance to be decent in standard. Curate's gonna need a graveyard deck where the milling matters. Expression Rehearsal, I think it's just a solid cantrip spell that can show up in a bunch of different places. We also got, oh my goodness, a pretty exciting commander card. Solve the equation, two mana sorcery, search your library for instant or a sorcery, reveal it, put it in your hand. So this is just a three mana sorcery speed tutor for an instant or a sorcery, and there just aren't that many cards that do this. Obviously, Mystical Tutor, probably the best of the bunch. Instant speed, but you don't actually draw the card. It goes to the top of your deck. Uh, we have Invert Invent, which is is it, and it's six mana, but you can get an instant and a sorcery with the Invent side. The Selfie Equation, it's essentially the instant and sorcery version of, like, Fabricate or Idyllic Tutor. And on one hand, as we've seen, these cards aren't usually constructed staples. Like Idyllic Tutor, Grim Tutor are in standard right now, and they don't really see play. Paying a three mana tax to get your spell, normally not good enough for most decks. Uh, fabricate kind of the same way, not really a 60 card staple. On the other hand, in Commander, I think this is a new blue staple. Like if you look at playable blue cards in Commander, Mystical Tutor's in the top five. And while I don't think Salvi Equation is as good as Mystical Tutor, I think it might be the second best blue tutor 
tutor in the format. And when you look at the rest of the tutors, Fabricate, Spellseeker, Muddle the Mixture, these are all like top 50 blue cards in the format. They see a lot of play, and I think that Salve the Equation, in a vacuum, more powerful than any of them, especially in a blue deck that's probably going to have a lot of good spells, grabbing your Cyclonic Rifts or grabbing some card draw, whatever. There's a ton of flexibility here. So I think this is new blue stapling commander and in the right deck maybe it can see a bit of play in constructed like the cards we were talking about before the idyllic tutors of the world there are very narrow specific decks that do want those effects so maybe something similar can happen with salve the equation but i don't think it's a card that just like any blue deck you're is gonna play you're gonna use it so you can find your genesis ultimatum or something in your genesis ultimatum adventure ramp deck i don't think it's that type of card but in the right deck maybe you gotta get your storm finisher or something it definitely can serve a purpose finally today just a bunch of lower rarity stuff. Uh, nothing really to see here for Constructed, I don't think. A little bit overcosted, a little bit underpowered. This is just the commons and uncommons that'll kind of round out the Strixhaven draft format. So anyway, that brings us to the end of our daily Strixhaven spoilers for today. So what do you think about all these ridiculous new cards? What is at the top of your list from today? How do you like Wandering Archaic? Can that show up in Standard or is it just a Commander card? What about Flame Scroll Celebrant, our MDFC with the silence on the backside? What's that going to do to Standard? How powerful can that be against Emergent Ultimatums and the like? What about all the Is It spells? The big expensive ones you can discard to get a treasure like Creative Outburst, for example. Magma Opus. Like, what about Grinning Ingus? Can Storm be a thing in Historic or Weird Creature Storm in Standard? Thanks to the power of Grinning Ingus upping the Storm Cow. Kodak? I mean... Cody? Can Cody actually show up at standard, or is that just a sweet but not overpowered five-color commander? Let me know in the comments. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video, and I will talk to you soon. Dying for more spoiler coverage? Well, we've got you covered with daily spoiler videos every single day during spoiler season. Plus, you can always find the latest by heading over to mtgpreviews.com.